Good morning, Alberta Federation of Labor. And I bring you greetings and solidarity from the Wisconsin AFL-CIO. Um, I want to thank you for this kind invitation to be here uh, with you today. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Gil McGowan for this uh, kind invitation to be with you here and share these days uh, and, and learn from you uh, uh, this weekend. And uh, it was uh, Gil McGowan who invited me here in 2011 when we were in the midst of occupying the Capitol in Wisconsin. And uh, it was Jerry also that uh, uh, gave me a call and convinced me to uh, roll up my sleeping bag and, and uh, head on over to uh, Alberta. And we were in Calgary at that time. And I believe that we forged some very strong bonds. Um, and, and the connection between Alberta and Wisconsin is strong. And you all have been with us every step of our way in this great battle. And we were so pleased to have these videos that uh, Gil and Shaban would send us. And one of them that you'll remember was uh, when we were heading into our right to work battle, it was the entire board, the executive board of the Alberta Federation of Labor, who threw snowballs and said, this snowball is for you, Scott Walker. <laughs> and that was um, so uplifting to all of us in Wisconsin. We shared that on social media, and it really um, helped people to understand that our fight was larger than the fight just for Wisconsin, but really for union rights worldwide. So thank you for that, uh, Gil. And uh, Siobhan, Siobhan Vipond. I probably got that wrong. <laughs> But what a delight it was to me when I arrived at the National Labor Leadership Institute to see that Siobhan was one of my, uh, one of my fellow students at that, at that uh, training. And it was, has just been an absolute pleasure and delight to get to know Siobhan uh, over this time. Uh, she is a warrior, she's smart, she's strategic, and she's a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> and so what a great team you have um, with Gail and Siobhan uh, here at the Alberta Federation of Labor. I would also like to, I was so delighted to um, see my, my dear friend Heather Smith um, from the United Nurses Association, or uh, uh, sorry, Alberta Uni uh, Nurses Association, and of course Jane Sustrick and Linda Silas, who I was able to reconnect with. Um, I had the, the delight of coming here uh, for an invitation with the UNA also in 2011 and uh, to share that solidarity with uh, the nurses. And, and Heather has been, um, you know, uh, supporting me all these years, um, not only in my role as uh, the, in the, uh, the AFL-CIO, but also supporting me as an uh, individual in leadership. So thank you for that, Heather. Um, and so many other people that I got to see here. Um, also, my good friend Ricardo Acuna from the Parkland Institute. Um, Ricardo invited me to come to Parkland in 2011 as well. I was here so much in, in uh, uh, 2011. Lots going on. But uh, I am proud to be a fellow now of the Parkland Institute. And really his work is so very important that we invited him to come to Madison for my convention at the Wisconsin AFL-CIO, and he was uh, very, very well received. He talked about the Overton window that people really had not heard of in Wisconsin before, but they really, uh, really uh, uh, were so uh, impressed with his presentation about moving the discussion, about moving the discussion and thinking about and making space for what is possible and making space to go further in what we want. Not just to talk about what is pragmatic, but what is possible. And it always makes me think about, when, I, when he talks about the Overton window, uh, it always makes me think of this uh, idea that uh, the economy is not like the weather. That it is something that we change, we can change. Human beings have the ability to change our economic situation. Um, and I, I thought in the last couple of days, good thing that the economy is not like the weather because here in Calgary, we have 
four seasons in one day. So um, I was very happy about that. But it was so good to be welcomed here by so many others. Um, as I said, uh, Jerry uh, from the HSAA and uh, Scott from the Parkland Institute. Um, Jason from Medicine Hat, who reminded me uh, that he is following Wisconsin politics uh, regularly. And of course, Amanda, who came to uh, Wisconsin and actually helped on our election in 2012. And she is a great strategist and was so good to see her. Now, Mike Parker apparently also wants to come to Wisconsin uh, in the next election, and we welcome him and all of you to come and help us. So really, these have been great conversations as we compare and contrast our respective labor movements and look for ways to build stronger unions, which we know is the only way working people can get ahead, but it is also the only way that we can build just and equitable societies. Strong unions are essential to a functioning democracy. Because there is, and let me, let me say this loudly, but there is no substitute for strong unions. There is absolutely no substitute for strong unions. And, and that is why the work that you do each and every day is so very critical. You are the leaders in your workplaces. You are the leaders in your communities. You, through your unions and in concert with your fellow affiliates, join together through the Alberta Federation of Labor to set the goals high, to put plans together, and to fight to improve the lives of your working Albertans. And at this convention, I am so impressed with the work that you are doing and grateful that I have had the chance to spend some days with you. The issues that you are dealing with are so very critical. Good wages, precarious work, pensions, child care, health care, privatization. Go back to health care. I mean, I wish we would be having the discussions even slightly in the U.S. that you're having here because health care costs are, are really uh, uh, doing us in in the U.S., as you know. Privatization, the threats of privatization to your public services, and union rights and the value of education. You here through, at your convention, debating and supporting one another, having dialogues, dreaming, planning, and of course, having lots of fun, <laughs> as what I saw last night at that dance. Because the struggles, brothers and sisters, are hard. And forging these bonds together and trusting one another, that is what, and even though you disagree with each other, once in a while, when the fight comes on and the chips are down, you are there for one another. And none of this happens by accident. As unionists, we stand on the shoulders of what those have done before us and what they have built and we carry on that tradition with new ideas and strategies, but never, ever forgetting where we came from and what we are fighting for, and never, ever giving up. Now, I know you had some pretty bad election results just a couple of weeks ago, and it is no fun to lose your majority. And I know, unfortunately, what it feels like to get your, key, your teeth knocked out uh, in an election. And I've got lots of examples of that. But no matter how long the odds, no matter how strong the winds of opposition, we know, you know, the only way we lose is if we step out of the ring. And as unionists in Wisconsin, in Alberta, or in Alberta, we are not getting out of the ring. We are staying in the fight. We are in this for the long game. We may lose some battles along the way, but if we are courageous and if we are smart, we will come out of it stronger because of the fight. Let me ask you, are you ready to fight? Yeah. Are you ready to fight? I know you are, and we also know that by learning from each other, we can also take some lesson, lessons that can save us from some beatings. And so that's why I am here with you today to share some lessons 
And from what I understand, one of the first uh, agenda items of the Jason Kenney uh, administration uh, from Jason Kenney and his cronies is to roll back gains that you have made for working people in Alberta. And I understand that it may also include some attacks um, on unions by imposing some U.S. branded right to work style attacks. There are lots of things we must do and I'd like to focus on a few. Number one, from the lessons that we have learned. Number one, internal organizing both in the public and private sector and member engagement with purpose and loyalty is so very important. That is uh, what we need to do and make a plan to make sure that our internal unions are strong, that we make a plan to talk to uh, each other and uh, have people really understand the value of what they do each and every day for themselves and for society in general. Number two, to hold your political parties accountable and be strong advocates for unions. And I know our parties are different in here, here and in the U.S., but for us, it was very important that we hold the Democrats, who are often our allies, accountable to, uh, uh, to uh, holding up strong unions. And number three is to make sure that we as unionists are speaking for all workers and that we are advocating for all workers in our society and that we open our doors wide to new people that are not in unions and teach unionism, teach solidarity, teach how to come together in a team to form a stronger voice in the workplace and society. And so, brothers and sisters, I am so pleased to be here and have the opportunity to be back in Alberta. The men and women of the Alberta Federation of Labor are and will always remain cherished friends and allies of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO. Eight years ago, you stood with us when Governor Scott Walker launched an assault on worker rights that was the moral equivalent of the attack on Pearl Harbor. You stood with us, and for that, I thank you. And now, nearly a decade on, we see clearly what this unprecedented attack was just the opening battle in a political and economic war pitting Wall Street against Main Street, the hyper-wealthy few against the hard-working many. Alberta, you stood with us in solidarity as we fought back. You stood with us as we took to the streets 100,000 strong. You stood with us as we pledged to say no. We pledged to say no to Scott Walker because no governor, no politician has the right to take away our unions. We pledged to say no to build our own future by reinvigorating our labor movement. And now, as you meet to consider the next Alberta, I'd like to provide you with a Wisconsin perspective on choosing your own future. Specifically, I've been asked to share some thoughts about the phenomenon of Trump, or more correctly, Trumpism coming north, and how labor must respond. And obviously, I don't have all the answers, but I have a few perspectives for you. And to do that, let me take you back to January 2011. Newly elected Scott Walker is caught on video talking with Diane Hendricks. Does anybody know about Diane Hendricks? The billionaire donor last year, Forbes magazine named her America's richest self-made woman. Women. And though I suspect the men and women who actually do the work in her companies might quibble with that self-made part, but I digress. <laughs> In this video, she asked Walker, and did anybody see, this is a video that was uh, part of uh, As Goes Janesville, and he was caught on tape speaking with Diane Hendricks. And she says to him, oh, Scott, any chance we'll ever get a chance to be a completely red state and work on these unions and become right to work? And Scott Walker responds, oh, yeah. The first step is we're going to deal with collective bargaining for all public sector employees because you use divide and conquer. That opens the door to right to work once we do that. So he had a plan to do that and opened the door they did. And Governor Scott Walker, after stripping public sector workers of collective bargaining rights, Walker and his allies in the state legislature unleashed a torrent of anti-worker policies. So-called right to work, 
the elimination of prevailing wage laws and project labor agreements for public construction projects, slashing of licensing and training requirements, a weakening of child labor laws, and so much more. A giant gift basket of bad legislation designed to serve the interests of people like Diane Hendricks and the Koch brothers. It soon became clear that Scott Walker and his cronies were not the brains behind the operation. Their assault on working families was being designed and implemented on a national level. In U.S. states around the country, although not as brutal as in Wisconsin, anti-union laws were being passed. In Wisconsin, with the executive and legislative branches firmly in the hands of those implementing this anti-worker agenda, our labor movement often found ourselves on the defensive, but we never stopped fighting. Now, Wisconsin is, uh, was a deeply symbolic target for them. As the 19th century ended, more efficient and productive factories had created jobs and opportunities, but also dangerous working conditions and poor pay for workers. To solve these problems, reformers in Wisconsin pushed for cleaner cities, safer workplaces, meaningful labor laws, and a more democratic government. The progressive movement, as it was called, established direct primary elections that gave voters, rather than political bosses, the right to choose primary candidates. It also raised taxes on railroads, broke up business monopolies, preserved state forests, dis defended small farmers. Progressive reformers also institu instituted one of the nation's first worker compensation laws. Also one of the first, the first unemployment insurance in the entire nation. We passed laws to regulate factory safety and we formed the first public sector union. We established a state income tax and limited work hours for children. Later, in Wisconsin, we established the first Family Medical Leave Act in the entire United States. And so as a result, Wisconsin became synonymous with the pro-worker, pro-union policies. So in 2011, what better place to field test a new generation of anti-worker strategies? The stakes were high. Right-wing anti-labor activist Grover Norquist, you know Grover Norquist, he recently wrote this. Quote, Trump's unexpected victory in 2016 did not lay the groundwork for Republican political dominance. But the March 2011 signing of Act 10, Act 10 is that, that uh, assault on public sector workers, he said, but the, but the March 2011 signing of Act 10 by Wisconsin's Scott Walker certainly did. If Act 10 is enacted in a dozen more states, he says, the modern Democratic Party will cease to be a competitive power in American politics. It is that big a deal. So let me pause for a moment in the story to provide a bit of background on the current electoral landscape. Uh, landscape. Through partisan redistricting, the Republican Party was able to draw electoral maps that virtually guaranteed their hold on the majority. Essentially, they created a scenario in which Republican politicians around the state get to choose their voters instead of the other way around. Here's one example of how this plays out. In the last election for the lower house in the state legislature, Republicans received 46% of the overall votes. But they ended up with two-thirds of the seats. A lawsuit challenging these hyper-partisan electoral maps was brought all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which refused to hear, hear the case on technical grounds. And it will be going back uh, to the lower court and then back again to the U.S. Supreme Court with a couple of other uh, cases, one from Maryland and one for North Carolina. So the battle for redistricting is, is, is on. My point is, that the challenges we face do not come from a single politician or even a single political party. Instead, our union movement is, a contest, is in a contest with hyper-wealthy national or even global interests seeking to alter the basic structure of society in their favor. 
Will wealth be distributed widely, reflecting the efforts of hardworking families who play by the rules, or will it be con concentrated into fewer and fewer hands of those who have the political power to rig the economy? This sense of impunity, of having the power to disregard the will of the voters, was on full display after the elections in Wisconsin last November. The spark of the protests in 2011, lit with your support, ignited a new passion among working people. Union members became engaged and energized in a way they hadn't in generations. And not just union members, but all working people. And so, the so-called right to work law was enacted in workplace after workplace. Private sector wor workers with the newfound ability to opt out they had the ability to opt out, opt out of their unions with uh, the right to work laws, but instead they stood strong. <laughs> Polling shows actually now that people are more and more uh, uh, understanding the value of unions in the economy and the favorability of unions is going up, especially amongst millennials. And so since Scott Walker became governor in election after election and race after race, union members worked tirelessly to get our allies into office. We manned phone banks. We knocked on doors. We volunteered in any way we could. We won some important victories. Some seats that had long been considered safe by our opponents were flipped to our allies, sometimes for the first time in decades. But the strong headwinds of gerrymandering remained and the legislature stayed in the hands of those pursuing an anti-worker agenda. But in the last election in November 2018, something wonderful happened. Finally, we kicked that union buster in chief, Scott Walker, out of office. And after eight long years, brothers and sisters, that was a glorious, glorious night. It was a long night, and it was a close election. And uh, it was, uh, we didn't even get the, the results until well after midnight because the race was so close. And as we were there, and I was at the, the party in Madison, uh, nobody left the party. People stayed. People stayed, people were like, we are not going to, to, to leave this hall until every last vote is counted. And so what do you do in this time when you're waiting for the results to come in? You start to find out what's going on in each, in each small town throughout Wisconsin. And so we started to add it up, what was going on in the city of La Crosse, what was going on in the city of Green Bay, what was going on with the absentee ballots in Milwaukee. And so those of us who were uh, collecting this data, uh, we added it up and we knew that we were going to be able to put it over the top. And so that was a really um, uh, amazing night. And uh, I've, never, I've never seen so much joy in people other than at a Packer game. So it was, uh, it was really a momentous uh, occasion. And uh, as uh, uh, Brother uh, Mike Parker stated uh, that it was Governor Scott Walker's own rule that he, uh, that he changed the rules, which he did change a lot of the rules around democracy, but for a recount. And so he got, um, he got backed into that himself because he wasn't able to have an automatic recount because of the law that he himself changed. <laughs> so too bad for you, Scott Walker. Um, but but in, in Wisconsin, every voter, like I said, gets to vote in those statewide elections. And so for all five statewide ballots, or statewide candidates for office, we won all five of those. We elected a state treasurer, Sarah Godlewski, who is committed to acting as a consumer advocate, um, a secretary of state with deep ties to Wisconsin progressive movement, a lieutenant governor, a friend of mine, Mandela Barnes, who acknowledges his roots proudly as a union, in a union family, and Attorney General Josh Call, who's ready to use the law to protect ordinary people rather than the privileged wealthy elites. And in the sweetest victory of all, we elected Tony Evers, a career educator as governor, ending the terrible eight-year tenure of Scott Walker. It took us a while, 
Alberta, but we did it. Let me say a few words about Governor Evers. And while his election will not immediately turn back the clock and erase eight years of bad policy by the Walker administration, it is already making a difference. Having the executive branch willing to serve as a check on a demonstrably uh, hostile state legislature is clearly good news for working families. The kind of policies for which labor has been advocating reflect not partisan interests, but basic fairness. Governor Evers' first executive orders reiterated the need for a clear non-discrimination policies in state employment, public services, and contracting. He ordered cabinet secretaries to provide state workers with meaningful and regularly, regular opportunities for input and feedback. Quite a departure from the Act 10 anti-worker rhetoric of the previous administration. He also established a task force to investigate deliberate misclassification of employees as independent contractors. The governor's budget also reflects a welcome willingness to invest public resources in ways that support working families. Of particular interest to labor are commitments to restore union rights by repealing right to work and the restoration of prevailing wage and project labor agreements and ensure publicly funded construction projects are done by qualified workers earning a family supporting wage. The budget also calls for the minimum wage to be increased and puts more money into public education and badly needed infrastructure repair. It also, it also calls for the state's nonpartisan legislative reference bureau to take over the redistricting process. And despite from what we're hearing from Republican leaders in the state legislature, these are hardly radical proposals. In fact, a recent poll found recently that 57% of Wisconsin voters want to see an increase in the minimum wage, and fully 72% want to see our redistricting process changed to, a fair, to fair maps. And because of our efforts, people understand this issue of redistricting in ways that they did not even know 10 years ago. The way maps were drawn was once uh, you know, the ground for political junkies getting into the weeds, and now uh, those weeds have been cleared aside, and these conversations about fairness in our maps are happening at kitchen tables all across Wisconsin. So we have the budget the budget has been put out there now of course the the legislature like i said is is still controlled by uh, the republicans and they will uh they have pledged to take out everything that is good out of the election in their first uh, in the in the budget in one of their first moves so it will be a battle but we will continue to educate and mobilize around these good pro uh, policies in our governor's budget um I want to tell you a little bit about what happened after uh, we elected Tony Evers and kicked Scott Walker to the curb uh, in 2018. He, he wasn't done, and he decided to have a lame duck session. I don't know if any of you uh, saw, saw a word of that, but um, Scott Walker and his allies in the legislator, legislature weren't prepared to concede even after they had lost the election. And before Governor Evers and, and the other new officials were even inaugurated, Republicans called themselves into a special extraordinary session and hastily passed a series of laws stripping the, stripping the offices of governor and attorney general of many of their powers. Shame is right. This so-called lame duck legislation has prompted numerous lawsuits which will ulti ultimately be settled in court, but the biggest lesson to be drawn is how, how audacious they were in their willingness to take power away from the democratically elected new governor. And I want to just let you know about this because the, the, the way that these bills and these, these attacks on labor and working people came, they were fast and furious. And they came faster and faster as the eight years went on. And I suspect that you'll have to be dealing with some of these same, same strategies, not only in what the laws are, what the, what the proposals are, but the way in which they bring them forward. So let me just let you know that this lame duck bill, which, um, which would strip the governor uh, from his powers to make uh, appointments, it also um, said that 
that if there is a lawsuit that comes to the legislature that they do not then need to go through the Attorney General, they could hire their own lawyers, even Chicago lawyers, at, at any cost to the taxpayers uh, to represent them. So this bill, this bill in the special, special extraordinary session came out at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. 4.30 is when the bill was posted, okay? On Monday morning, they had a committee hearing on the bill. So the public got notified at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon, and on Monday morning, people were expected to be there to testify. And they also scheduled a vote in the Assembly in, on Wednesday and a vote in the Senate on Thursday, and the governor signed the bill into law on Friday. So within one week, a bill was introduced, went through the process, and signed into law within one week. So these bills come fast and furious, and we were, we were proud because we, we did respond very quickly. Um, unfortunately, we had a lot of practice in that. Um, but it really is, uh, you know, we got the word out immediately about what this was happening with this lame duck, uh, 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 you know, taking away of power from the newly elected governor. And we got the word out all throughout Wisconsin and also took it to the, uh, the national, national uh, uh, media th uh, within days. And so that practice and that, that deliberateness of, of, of educating and making sure that we expose what is going on is so very important and I'm sure something that you're going to want to do as you go forward with, with your new government. And so now at this point, I haven't said anything in the main character in my assigned story, <laughs> Donald Trump. So let's widen the focus to the national political scene. We can't avoid the fact that in 2016, many working people in the US, sadly, uh, including some union members, voted for a shady real estate developer and reality TV star to be their president. How and why did that happen? I believe some of that answer lies in the failure of establishment politicians, including Democrats, to address the very legitimate concerns of workers in a global economy. Really? Okay. I'm checking with Siobhan about my time here because, you know, I don't know how long you want me to go on here, but I could go on all afternoon. Um, so technological innovations, the, the mobility of capital and new patterns of trade have transformed the relationship between capital and labor, and in fact, the nature of work. And once the owners of a factory had little choice as to where their workers came from and where the work was done. A Calgary industrialist thought in terms of his own town, his province, and if circumstances allowed, the wider Canadian market. His workforce was by definition almost exclusively local, giving workers greater bargaining power. But now, in many sectors, labor has become just another industrially, industrial input, a commodity to be purchased at the lowest price available anywhere in the world. This fundamentally changed the equation. And so a few generations ago, economists were, were taught that the standard split of the income generated by a typical economy was 70% for labor and 30% for capital. Well, we've all seen how dramatically that has changed. In the US today, the wealthiest 1% of families hold about 40% of all wealth, while the bottom 90% hold less than one quarter. In our political system, that kind of maldistribution of wealth creates a similar maldistribution of political power. It's little wonder that working people feel like the system is stacked against them. And with an inordinate portion of the wealth they helped create going to someone else while they struggle. This is the environment that has given rise not only to Donald Trump, but to a new and dangerous class of false populace around the world. When a population feels threatened, when working people correctly sense something patently unfair is going on, it's easy for a clever politician to portray him or herself as an outsider and cast blame on the established political order. 
The danger lies in stoking and directing fear and anger for political ends. A common tactic is to pit one group of working people against another. Scott Walker's divide and conquer approach writ large. False populism diverts people's attention away from the, the rewriting of our economy to favor the wealthy and deregulation to, 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 uh, to switch our tax code and to further privatization efforts. While the false populist, Donald Trump and others, fills the airwave, airwaves and space with, with misplaced blame. We see this in many places around the world today. Brazil's uh, new far-right uh, president, Jair Bolsonaro, was elected against a background of, in an economic recession. With 14 million people unemployed and many workers trapped in precarious employment with terrible working conditions. The com campaign successfully stirred up the anger of working people against a variety of scapegoats, including labor unions, which Bolsonaro claimed to have an excess of rights. Meanwhile, his economic team consists of neoliberalists pursuing a Latin American version of trickle-down eco economics based on policies that favor corporations at the expense of workers. In the U.S., Donald Trump's message has been less overtly anti-union, instead focusing on economic nationalism. In his inaugural address, he said, quote, for many decades, we've enriched foreign industry at the expense of American industry. One by one, the factories shuttered and left our shores, not without a thought to the millions upon millions of American work workers left behind. The wealth of our middle class has been ripped from their homes and redistributed across the entire world. So to all Americans in every city, near and far, small and large, from mountain to mountain, from ocean to ocean, hear these words, you will never be ignored again. Those are the words of Donald Trump. And so sadly, uh, the, 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 the Democratic campaign, the campaign for president in 2016, uh, working people did not hear that they mattered enough. And those words that he said were not uh, 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 said by our uh, candidate for, for president. In fact, uh, many Democratic politicians were afraid to say the word union. And that message by Donald Trump is false populism. And it is a message very cleverly crafted for people who felt left behind by the changing global economy. The problem is that Donald Trump's words bear, bear little and no resemblance to his administration's policies. 10 of his cabinet members have a combined net worth of $3.1 billion. How's that for draining the swamp? Betsy DeVos, the Education Secretary, has a lifelong career in trying to destroy public education. From the corp and, and they display a tendency to prioritize the interests of business over labor. And so let's take an example um, from the U.S. Department of Labor. Under the Obama administration, the department adopted a rule that would have raised the salary threshold for overtime protection, overtime exemption, sorry. That's the amount a worker can make, he can earn, and still be eligible for overtime pay under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Basically, the threshold is supposed to protect workers with little bargaining power, people who make up a growing segment of our workforce, like frontline supervisors at fast food restaurants. From being forced to, pay, be, for, be, from being forced to work unpaid overtime because they're salary. So Obama wanted to raise it from $23,000 a year to $47,000 a year. But last month, Labor Secretary, Trump's Labor Secretary Acosta, proposed setting the, example, the exemption threshold at a much lower level, only $35,000. If you do the math, that works out to about $16.90 per hour. At a time when several places around our nation have established a $15 per hour Minimum wage, $16 and change, doesn't exactly sound like an executive salary to me. The Economic Policy Institute estimates that by lowering the threshold to $35,000, 8.2 million workers will lose overtime protections, the majority of whom are women and people of color. 
Overall, the Trump administration also proposed budget slashes $2 billion from the Department of Labor, much of it from job creation uh, training programs. But there is one area that the department would like, would get, would like to get a multi-million dollar increase, and that is the office that is investigating union elections and finance. In a move that George Orwell would appreciate, the administration is creating an anti-worker Department of Labor. And you all know about in December of 2017, uh, President Trump and Republicans in Congress jammed through a massive tax giveaway to big corporations and the wealthy. And they are, they are, they are attempting to slash uh, important, uh, important programs like Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and public education. And so, brothers and sisters, these are the threats that are before us. A changing global economic environment that has left large numbers of working families at risk. A well-coordinated, well-funded effort to alter the political landscape to keep those working for the wealthiest segment of population in power permanently. And false populist movements that divide working people seeking to, seeking to uh, take their power to, away to resist. This is how I interpret the first part of my assigned topic, Trump comes north. And so now let's spend some time on part two, the important question of what we should do about it. And I, sp I spoke about this earlier uh, at the beginning of my remarks, but really what we need to do about it is to go back to internal organizing, making sure that our public and private sector unions understand the importance of what they do every day, and fortifying yourselves, making a plan to do it. To hold endorsed politicians accountable to unionism and to have allegiance to that. Brothers and sisters, the right knows how important unions are. It is important that also our political parties that, are, that claim to be our allies also understand how important union, unions are to our economy. And also so that we should speak to, for all workers, both union and, and non. That we open the doors wide to workers, any, anybody who gets up every day and works for someone else ought to belong to a union. And we are the ones that need to teach that unionism, to teach uh, people how, how to come together in a team to advocate for themselves because truly that is the only way that working people have a chance to move forward. And so, the, the fights that we went through in Wisconsin, uh, you know, when Act 10 came to us, we fought back and we fought back hard. We had the largest fight back uh, in Wisconsin that the U.S. labor movement had seen in decades. And it inspired working people to stand together in ways that we hadn't seen for a very, very long time. It, it allowed people from across the nation and indeed from throughout the world to understand how important union rights are and that they must be protected. And those attacks on labor were brutal, but we didn't give up. We exposed the Koch brothers for what they are. Do you remember that famous uh, fake call that Scott Walker got from uh, the Koch brother where he was duped and he thought he was actually talking to the Koch brother? And he was saying, you know, thanks for all your help, thanks for all your help. Well, it was, it was that and our, our fight back that exposed who was really behind these anti-union politicians like Scott Walker. It was a galvanizing moment where people, uh, where people came together and it is so wonderful to see young people now who said, you know, I was only uh, 12 years old and I came to that, those protests with my mom and dad. And I understand how important the uh, union movement is, and I was so happy to be part of that. And that becomes part of their DNA. And you can never take away that engagement and that participation in a fight for people who go through it. And so that is the silver lining of our struggle. And we know that, um, that these agenda items are going to be implemented quickly, and we need to stand ready to fight back. Another lesson we learned is that we cannot rely on any politician or political party to safeguard our interests. In the United States, okay. Okay. In the United States, for example, the Democratic Party is frequently seen as labor's ally, but it is not the Labor Party. 
And I frequently remind ourselves that we must remember that we are not a red movement, we are not a blue movement, we are the labor movement. And as such, we must be prepared to be our own champions. And we must hold politicians accountable regardless of which party they are from and know that we must be vigilant and never naively leave the hard work of public policy making to those who we've written the checks. And not accept that endorsed candidates accept our help and then not talk about our issues. And perhaps the most fundamental is the acceptance that ours is a race without a finish line. A contest in which the bell will always call us out to fight another round. The struggle between those who work and those who profit from our labor is as old as human, as human society. And it can only truly be won if the other side gives up. Brothers and sisters, we will not be the side that surrenders. To do so would be a betrayal for those, of those who fought so long and so hard before us. It would be a betrayal to those brave Alberta miners and tradespeople who first banded together in 1912 to form a labor federation to fight for better working conditions for working people, their families, and their communities. It would be a betrayal of men like Tommy Douglas, who understood that every Canadian deserves the right to have quality health care, regardless of their economic or social situation. And it would be a betrayal of those who will come after us, who fairly will ask, what did we do to leave their world better than we found it? So when Trump comes north, how must we respond? As we in the labor movement has always done, confident in the rightness of our cause, bold in the scope of our vision, and secure in the steadfastness of those standing with us. And through it all, Alberta, know that your brothers and sisters are ready to stand with you in Wisconsin. Thank you and solidarity.